we're back for part two. If you missed the first part, it's down in the description. It's gonna be up in the corner there for you to go to. In that video, we talked about Ripple's response on the motion to intervene. In this video, we're talking the SEC's response, and I am heated, so much so I had to even expose some man cleavage to let the air in because I am steaming with what they had to say. If we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed on all the latest news and updates. And don't forget to hit that 10,000 subscriber giveaway also down in the description. Everything we talk about, linked in the description. Everything that you need to know, it's down there. XRP under $1.50 right now. If you are wanting to buy in, get that sign up link to uphold so you can trade XRP in the US. Don't miss out. Could be one of the last chances to get in. Now, I don't wanna belabor this too long because this is lengthy. The part one video I intended to go straight through, but that hit 20 minutes just hitting on the SEC's lie and the ripple take. This document from the SEC is 33 pages long. Hit me a like if you appreciate the speed reading that I had to go into getting this video out to you because it just dropped this evening. I filmed the other one quick and then got right into this one. So let's talk about what's happening. Again, Deaton filed the motion to intervene. The SEC is responding to that on the due date that was set by the court, which is today. And then we'll see from here where everything else kind of falls through. Ripple already responded with their answer saying that they were okay with this. Now, here's the SEC. You, if you hold XRP, you're going to not be happy with what's in this letter. I was not happy. And I am sure that uh, Sir Deaton will not be happy. He is probably going to respond to uh, what is in here uh, in short order. I'll link his Twitter down below. That way you can hear from him directly how he feels. No legal or financial advice here, but do check out his Twitter for his response. Now, let's get going right into this because they have some pretty incendiary type statements in here that are perhaps intended to rile us. Who knows? But... Let's look. So plaintiff SEC respectfully submits his memorandum of law in opposition to the motion to intervene purportedly filed on behalf of all simu similarly situated XRP holders for the reasons set, uh, set below, set forth below. Now, this is important. They say that it's purported to be on behalf of XRP holders. So they're going straight from the get go, hitting out saying, no, this isn't. So in their preliminary statement, this is where they're giving the background and introduction into how the involvement came about from Deaton's side. How here, movements appear to be six individual XRP investors, and then now they seek to intervene as additional defendants in the enforcement action. And here, pay close attention, just in case you don't know the background. Movements try, first tried to inject themselves and the thousands of other secondary market investors they purport to represent into the SEC's enforcement action by filing a petition for men, uh, mandamus against the SEC and federal district court in Rhode Island. We covered this a while back on the channel when that happened back in March. In that petition, they sought compensation for the irreparable damage they purportedly suffered. This isn't purported. We all suffered damage, right, from this case. I think that's pretty obvious, but... We'll continue. Following the institution of this enforcement action against defendants, a number of third-party digital asset trading platforms delisted XRP and XRP secondary market value dropped. See those hashtags? Delist SEC. That's my new one. Follow along. Movements sought an order directing the SEC to amend its complaint in this action to exclude any claim that the XRP owned by movements constitute securities today. The SEC, the SEC opposed movements petition on several grounds, and in response, movements withdrew their petition and effectively restyled it as the instant intervention motion against the SEC. 
Supreme Court precedent dictates that this type of interference with government enforcement actions is constitutionally and statutorily barred as it intrudes on executive branch prosecutorial discretion. To the extent movements are instead seeking to bring claims against the SEC as third-party plaintiffs, as they sought to do in their mandamus petition, they are barred under Section 21G of the Securities Exchange Act of 1934 and sovereign immunity. Here's their arguments. They say that there's no way you can intervene because it's the government agency and you're overstepping on their discretion to prosecute. And besides this, in the pink here, as I read through it, I want you to pay special attention. This is what they're going to argue through the course of this very lengthy document. Even if mo if movements could somehow surmount these barriers to intervention, which they cannot, they do not and cannot demonstrate that they would advance any argument or adduce any relevant evidence that defendants through the four law firms capably representing them cannot. Indeed, movement's papers essentially recite defendant's litigation position, nor can movement show that their interests, if any, are not adequately protected by defendants given that movement's objectives are the same as the defendant's. So they're going to take the opposite position that Ripple just presented. You're going to see a direct one-for-one -one contradiction of what we just went over in part one. Check it out if you haven't. And now they are saying that this whole motion to intervene, it just can't go through because there's too many barriers and it doesn't serve a purpose. Let's look at the detailed reasons why. An SEC enforcement action with thousands of individual investors intervening on both sides to advance legal and factual arguments the SEC and defendants are capable of making would unnecessarily complicate this action, cause undue delay, require additional judicial resources, and prejudice the SEC's efforts to enforce the federal securities laws. This is particularly so given that movements seek to advance a series of mistaken rebuttals about the Howey standards to arguments the SEC is not making here. So it's their approach here is just to basically discredit the motion to intervene in general. And then on the other side, if the court were to find that it was legitimate to say that, hey, this is just a mess and it's going to cause havoc to this case. And they literally say that it would wreak havoc. And then that that in and of itself is an additional reason to not allow this to go forward. So they're going to give background. We're going to kind of skip over it. You've got the invest, XRP investors class actions against Ripple. So they're bringing up saying, hey, there were cases where XRP investors actually sought lawsuits against Ripple. You can see where these were filed. There were a couple of these that happened. Uh, but that's not really relevant here either. But they're still bringing it up as a way to sort of discredit the whole the XRP holders, our position against the SEC by saying, well, hey, if XRP holders were suing Ripple, then, well, it's not our fault. Now here, this is the background again on what happened just shortly uh, a little while ago about the petition. So let me just read through this because I, I want everybody familiar with what happened here. The petition was brought on behalf of investors who have purchased, exchanged, received, and or acquired XRP. Petitioners claimed that they had suffered immediate and irreparable damage as a result of the SEC enforcement action when XRP was immediately de delisted from 54 exchanges and that XRP's value has been cut 75% costing billions of dollars in losses for innocent investors that have absolutely no connection to Ripple or its executives, including significant economic losses included by petitioners. This is in the petition from Deaton. This is also mentioned, as you saw earlier, if you saw the video, in Ripple's letter where they talk about like $15 billion in value being wiped out like that. So interesting. It's all laid out right here. But they're citing this to say, hey, this is what happened in the petition. And now that this is inappropriate. Petitioners sought, among other things, damages from the SEC and an order directing the SEC to amend its complaint against Ripple to exclude the claim that X, XPR, now XRP, owned by petitioners constitute securities. 
The petition accused the SEC of bringing its enforcement action with improper motive and the specific intent to cause irreparable harm. The petition also attacked former SEC Chairman Jay Clayton personally and accused him of political and or personal improper motives in approving the action against the defendants. Comment below what you think Jay Clayton's motives were. Were they pure? Is he the knight in shining armor in this whole case? <laughs> the SEC thus made clear that this court has jurisdiction to decide the SEC's claims against Ripple, but nowhere suggested that the court has jurisdiction or that it is proper to hear all matters with any connection to SR XRP. Faced with the clear legal precedent cited by the SEC, movements withdrew the petition on March 14th, 2021. So they're saying that the petition came out, we proved that it wasn't proper, and then they withdrew. But now that's what led to the motion to intervene. So we know that this happened. They're just restating facts. But here's what got us to today. Between February 28th and March 14th, 2021, Deaton noting that he was increasingly popular on Twitter for his efforts, pivoted from a strategy of seeking mandamus to collecting participants in a potential class action against the SEC. On March 14th, movements moved for intervention without complying with the court's pre-motion procedure. The court denied without prejudice. We saw this. The court denied the first motion, uh, motion to intervene. But after complying with the court's pre-motion procedure, movements filed the motion on April 19th, which has led us to this very document that was filed on the 19th. This is the response that was due on May 3rd. And then now we'll see what the response in into this whole mess today is. The motion puts forth no arguments or theories that the four law firms representing Ripple and the individu individual defendants in this litigation have not already made. Indeed, instead of focusing on the intervention requirements under Rule 24 or otherwise, movements demote much of, or devote much of their 30-page brief to restating defendants' arguments about the merits of this enforcement action which have no relevance to the question of intervention. So they're just saying, hey, the Ripple team is fully capable of arguing this and you've brought forth no points we don't think you should be here and they're going to go in here and they're going to try and, and tear deaton's arguments apart and uh yeah it's part of the reason why i was getting a little steamy here so basically they're saying okay section one two three four each one of these they're saying that ripple already made this point this is nothing new so i'm not going to go through them in detail we've discussed them before in short, movements offer nothing new for the court to consider. This is the whole SEC argument in this point. Their attorney, however, has continued to make public statements about the motivations for the SEC's filings in this litigation, which he has. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean that this is incorrect. It just means that he's made the statements. And they're going to refer to his Twitter. And he tweeted on April 22nd, his desire to depose a former SEC official who may or may not be named and casting this motion as a crusade to expose corrupt intent at the SEC. Hit that like button if you think there's corrupt intent at the SEC. As Deaton explained in March 15th, 2021 tweets, a petition was strategically utilized for demonstrating the supposed hypocrisy of the government's claims and the motion and purported class action are a part of a strategy to assert those claims. Now, this is the argument that is overarching through the remainder of this letter. So keep in mind, we are halfway through it and we're going to have a lot more detail behind this. I'm going to go through this intro to the argument and then we'll look at the points, but I'm not going to rehash everything as we go. They've got four points that they want to make. First, movements are barred under the United States Constitution and the Administrative Procedure Act from intervening as third-party defendants because the prosecutorial decision not to charge someone lies at the absolute discretion of the SEC. Does absolute power corrupt? Absolutely. Comment below. Second, the extent movements seek relief against the SEC as third-party plaintiffs, such claims are barred by Section 21G of the Exchange Act in sovereign immunity. 
Third, leaving aside those insurmountable barriers, the first two points that they say are insurmountable, movements are not entitled to intervention as of right under Rule 24. They do not have a cognizable interest in this action, and any interest they may have is well represented by the three parties the SEC has charged, being Ripple, Garlinghouse, and Larson. Fourth, even if the court reaches the issue of permissive intervention, which it should not, given the constitutional and statutory bars to intervention, movements should not be permitted to intervene under Rule four, uh, 24 for practical reasons. Inserting movements and the thousands of investors they purport to represent into this lawsuit and opening the door to potential intervention by other XRP investors who seek to make the SEC's arguments, including the class action investors, would cause undue delay and complication and hamper the SEC's law enforcement efforts. They don't want other people involved here because it's going to make life more difficult for them in the case. And it can take longer than what the original schedule is. Now, Ripple did, on, on their part also make the same statement that they don't want this to have a delay in the case. They don't want it to drag on because of the motion to intervene. As long as the interveners, the movements, don't slow down the process, the Ripple side is okay with it. But here, the SEC side is saying, hey, no matter what, they're just going to make this a mess and we don't want anything to do with them. So here we go. Each of these points they've got here, here's point one starting here. I'm going through this one quickly. This is really dry, and there's a lot of case law cited here. But I'm going to go to the one thing that they say, put simply, movements cannot intrude on the SEC's prosecutorial discretion by inserting themselves into this action as defendants, allowing movements to intervene to inject uncharged individuals and claims into this case would involve this court in decisions about the SEC's resource allocations and enforcement policy. The commission, however, and not the court, is best situated to evaluate the costs and benefits of enforcement. So what they're saying here is by seeking to mo this motion to intervene and to put themselves forth as defendants in the case, they are deciding for the SEC who the SEC is going to prosecute and the SEC says the court has no bearing, has no ability to make that decision or to rule on that because the SEC as an enforcement agency is the one who has the ability to decide who it's going to prosecute. So again, the motion to intervene, they're coming in as defendants in this case, right? And in representing XRP holders as defendants. But the SEC says, no, we chose not to come after these people. And so you can't be a part of this and the court can't determine that either. Only we, the SEC, can say who a defendant is in the case. Next, although movements claim to be seeking intervention as defendants, movements also appear to seek to vindicate claims or rights against the SEC. Right? So SEC, the movements are making claims against the SEC and supposed corruption and ill motives, both in their petition and then also in the court filings. The Exchange Act embodies the sound policy that law enforcement agents mu agencies must be allowed to determine the scope of their law enforcement actions without in interference by private litigants. So now they're saying that, again, the movements are trying to say who the SEC is coming after here. And again, going back to the headline, right? The, to the extent movements seek to intervene to seek relief against the SEC as third-party plaintiffs, Section 21 of the Exchange Act and Sovereign Immunity bar intervention. So it's not allowed. And so they go into lots of case law here. So you look here, SEC versus such and such bank, SNC versus Bancorp, SEC versus Prudential, LabTech, on and on and on, case law. Finally, to the extent movements seek to assert claims against the SEC, intervention is also improper because claims asserted against the SEC face the additional barrier of sovereign immunity. So because of this uh, immunity, they're saying, hey, they, they can't even do anything here. No, this isn't allowed. So these are their two most uh, solid points in their belief system that because of these first two 
there's no claim whatsoever to be able to intervene that's out the window. So, and they cite the case law for that and in their behalf. And so every one of these case law um, examples is from the SEC uh, taking some action against some other party. Now, the next point, movements do not meet the standard for intervention as of right. This one, I think, is probably their second weakest argument, which is why it's second to last. Uh, but they say movements fail to meet the requirements for intervention as of right under Rule 24. This is the exact opposite of what Ripple argues. They say the applicant, again, the same criteria, file a timely motion, claim an interest relating to the property or transaction that is the subject of the action, be so situated that without intervention, the disposition of the action may impair that interest and show that the interest is not already adequately represented by existing parties. Here, movements fail at minimum the second and fourth requirements. They cannot show a cognizable interest in the action, nor can they show that any interest they have is not adequately represented by defendants. Now, this is really weak because, yes, there is a provable interest in the outcome of this case. I think that's very clear. Now, on the fourth one, they still say that the defendants are representing the XRP holders, even though the defendants themselves have explicitly said, explicitly said, we just read it, they do not represent XRP holders in this. They have said that in writing. They have said it verbally. It is very clear they do not represent XRP holders. Very weak argument in this instance. So, as we keep going, I'm going to speed up a little bit here because of the time. Do check the link down below. I will link this in the description. So the platforms that supposedly harmed them are not a party to this suit and movements thus lack standing to seek relief against these platforms in the lawsuit. The registration of Ripple's and its affiliates offers and sales of securities is governed principally by Section 5 of the Securities Act. The registration of a trading platform or that of a broker or dealer are instead governed by provisions of the Exchange Act. Statutes the SEC has not exercised in its discretion to enforce in this particular case, and movements cannot force the SEC to do so. So they're trying to discredit the claim pertaining to the exchanges because they're saying this has nothing to do with this. We're dealing with XRP as a potential security that has nothing to do with the exchange. Again, SEC's claim there. And they say that the movements have not cited a single case in which a court allowed intervention by investors who sought to contest an SEC enforcement action. The three named defendants can adequately protect any interest by movements in this action. Again, they're saying that just one more time as they go through the finer points. Now, let's keep going here. There, even if the court reaches the issue of permissive intervention, the court should deny such intervention at least for practical reasons. And this, I believe, is their weakest argument by far, where they say intervention by movements in the thousands of XRP or thousands of investors they purport to represent would unduly delay and complicate the SEC's enforcement action and require additional judicial resources. Movements purport to represent over 12,600 XRP investors. That's not a proportion. That is a fact. It's on the document, and that number continues to grow. But this is what they say. Opening the door to permissive intervention in an SEC enforcement action by potentially tens of thousands of XRP investors with conflicting interests and objectives would cause incalculable confusion add unmanageable complexity and bring this court's review and administration of the underlying actions to a halt. Given the high level of interest in this litigation, participation by thousands of investors has already proven incredibly disruptive to Judge Netburn's court conferences. So they're complaining about what happened on the previous calls in regard to this uh, and giving an example. So very weak, I think. They don't want us to be represented in this case. I don't know why that would be when you are supposedly representing us. I think it's very funny that they continue to point to the XRP holders' interests being represented by the defendants when in this case, and in all cases involving the SEC, the SEC is supposed to be the one representing the interest of investors. They never once allege 
that they are protecting our interests, which is shocking. I, I don't see anywhere in this letter, and, and granted, there are certain sections I did uh, read very quickly, but nowhere do I see them allege that they are representing XRP holders. Every argument they say is that the interest of the movements and the holders of XRP is represented by the defendants, which uh, by my reading means that the SEC is actually against us. But uh, tell me what you think in the comments below. Let me know if you agree with that statement or if you think that that's just patently false. Now, Though movements claim that they do not seek additional discovery, if movements and the thousands of investors they purport to represent are brought into this action, the SEC would likely need discovery from movements, for example, concerning whether they are in fact XRP investors, such as through trading records. Further, movements would presumably move to certify a class of investors, which presumably the Ripple class action plaintiffs would oppose, to bring motions for summary judgment and to participate in the trial in this matter. All of this would impose a significant burden on the SEC and the court, but mainly on the SEC, and cause undue delay and unnecessary complications in an otherwise straightforward Section 5 enforcement action. So the SEC doesn't want to have to deal with us, basically. They don't want to have to deal with any XRP holders, uh, any of us peons. Uh, they don't want us to be involved, and they don't want to have to deal with the headaches around having to prove that people are XRP holders and then also have to do any additional discovery. Movement's ultimate aim in seeking to intervene is to inject issues into this action that do not involve defendants' violations as alleged in the amended complaint. The SE, And this, this is, again, circling right back. The SEC's workload, despite its limited budget and staff, would be sustain, substantially increased if such intervention were allowed. So their workload would get harder and they'd have to do more work. I'm sorry, SEC. Because movements spend so much of their brief setting forth a confused and incorrect characterization of the SEC's claims and applicable law, the SEC briefly discusses certain important though non-exhaustive points below, although none are relevant to deciding the motion. And in this section, they go through a lot of things here where they're trying to counter what was in the motion. I'm not going to go through that. I'll link everything down below. You can go through it yourself. But uh, again, just this this whole thing is just tedious and the redundant in many instances. And they're just trying to really discredit the source versus the substance, in my opinion. You know, in that section, they, they do try and come after Deaton pretty hard. Lastly, movements arguments that XRP are currency exempted from the definition of security also evidences a misunderstanding of controlling law. While the Exchange Act does not define currency, Treasury regulations define currency in the context of FinCEN regulations. XRP is plainly not currency under this definition, and FinCEN has repeatedly distinguished virtual currency such as XRP from real currency from the outset of Ripple's illegal sales to the present. Note that they state that as fact. Everything that the motion to intervene says is purported, but this is their statement of fact, Ripple's illegal sales. Indeed, FinCEN expressly notes that nothing it says about whether virtual currencies are subject to its money services business requirements is intended to constitute a determination that any virtual currency is currency for purposes of federal securities laws. And in any event, even if XRP were a real currency, I'm a real currency, which it is not, but it is. XRP could also have been and was offered and sold as part of an investment contract under Howey, and thus those offers and sales would still have been offers and sales of securities. In conclusion, finally, after 30 pages, we get to the final point of what they want out of this entire thing. Move and seek to intervene in this action to try and broaden the scope of the SEC's claims and to make arguments that defendants are already making or that misconstrue the law or both. Constitutional and statutory prosecutorial discretion, Section 21G of the Exchange Act and sovereign immunity bar movements intervention. But aside from those bars, movements do not meet the requirements for intervention 
as of right under Rule 24 and in any event should not be permitted to intervene, allowing thousands of investors to intervene in this case. To reiterate defendants' arguments and open the door to intervention by thousands of investors who seek to make the SEC's arguments will hopelessly delay the action, require additional judicial resources, and frustrate the role with which Congress entrusted the SEC to enforce the federal securities laws. Wow, what a mouthful. Um, the SEC continues to seek to bar this case or the participants in this case from being able to, to act. They do not want the motion to intervene to succeed. They don't want XRP holders to be represented or to have the movements, Deaton um, and, and his uh, accompanying parties there, to be able to stand in place here uh, with the defendants and to be able to have their voice in this case. So it's very interesting to see just the the very odd instance of an entity whose very existence is predicated upon investor protection standing in strict opposition of investors within this uh, whole battle. And again, as I mentioned, they never once allege to be representing the holders of XRP. And they always say that the defendants are aligned in representing the holders of XRP, which I think is really telling when you're saying explicitly that you are not fulfilling your mission and that the people you are attacking are the people who you are in very purpose and mission meant to defend and represent. Uh, it is a shame. And I think that it is um, kind of a tragedy that we're seeing unfold here. But it does make for some very interesting... Uh, <laughs> arguments and um, so, some engaging content, at least, I think. So if you found any value in this information, hit me a like on your way out. Hit that subscribe button. That way you don't miss out on future updates. We've got a lot more to come in this case because it's just back and forth. And I am very eager to hear what John Deaton has to say about the SEC's letter here. So hit that subscribe button. Don't forget the 10K subscriber giveaway. I want to get that Nano S off of my desk. I have it sitting right here, brand new, unopened. It's ready. Are you ready? Hit the giveaway button below, and I will see you in the next one.